So let's talk a little bit more about applications of the biotechnology that we've learned so far this week. One of the coolest ways, I think, is biofarming. The idea behind it is production of proteins in genetically modified plants and animals. So we can do a lot of this in bacteria, um, but it's even cooler if we can do it in these plants and animals, things that we might be able to, say, eat, uh, or be able to use in other ways like that. It's important because a lot of times when you're growing things in eukaryotic cells, you're going to have different modifications, you know, the acetylations, the phosphorylations, all these sorts of things. They might be different in the, these eukaryotic cells than they are in the prokaryotic cells. So there's some examples of some that are available or under development. Um, erythropoietin, which is used for anemia, can grow at any coli, these cultured mammalian cells. Um, interferons used for MS, multiple sclerosis, and cancer, also grown there. Human growth hormone, different types of antibodies. Um, human clotting factors used for people with hemophilia. Um, and some of these they're working on growing, like I said, in bananas. You could just eat a banana, theoretically, and you could get a vaccine to hepatitis B. Pretty cool. Um, potentially you could eat a potato that was genetically modified, and you could be protected against Norwalk virus. So very cool. So right now, synthetic human insulin is produced in bacteria. Obviously, insulin is very important for diabetics. This is something that they used to get from pig, uh, from isolating from pig pancreas. Now we're able to get it from bacteria. So we're able to grow it much more cheaply and much greater abundance. The two insulin subunits produced as these fusion polypeptides. You purify them, you cleave them, uh, and they can unite together to form your active insulin. This was the first therapeutic protein produced by recombinant DNA technology to be approved for use in humans. Several other proteins for therapeutic uses also produced in bacteria. We mentioned a few of them, as well as these eukaryotic organisms. The catch is um, some of them bacteria are, are useful for, however, a lot of these eukaryotic proteins, they're unable to process or correctly modify. So in these, we'll have to use other things, things like bioreactors, like um, literally a herd of goats or cows. Maybe we can get it so it's expressed in their milk. You could have a glass of milk and get your anti um, antibodies to whatever virus rather than uh, other methods. Baculovirus is a virus that I've worked with. This is a virus used to infect insect cells. Again, you can scale up production of these pretty well to try to isolate uh, the protein of interest. They really pack in whatever protein uh, that you're trying to, to produce. They can produce it pretty high quantities in those cells. And up to 50% of uh, the proteins in a particular cell can be those viral proteins. And so it's a pretty efficient process. Vaccine production, probably the most beneficial application of biotechnology, although they're still working on others as well. Subunit vaccines are going to consist of one or more surface proteins from the virus or bacteria, and these have been developed by genetic engineering. So the hepatitis B surface virus protein uh, cloned into a yeast expression vector, purified from yeast, packaged for use in a vaccine. Gardasil is another one that's relatively new. It provides immunity against HPV, or human papillomavirus. It's often given um, around adolescent age now to children. Uh, and this is incredibly useful. This is the, like the first examples of vaccines against cancers. So this uh, will lead to cervical cancer in women. The hepatitis V virus can lead to liver cancers. These edible vaccines, not only is it less painful, um, it's also, you can uh, avoid a lot of the problems that we have with our current vaccines. Things like the cost, cost of production is pretty high. Uh, you can avoid needles, a lot of people are scared of those. You also don't have to worry about what are you going to do with those needles once they're used. You can't reuse the needles and how are you going to dispose of them safely? So all you do is you take the gene from the human pathogen, you insert it into the vector, you place that vector into the plant cells, then leaf segments are going to sprout into the whole plants, and at least theoretically, they'll be carrying the gene from the human pathogen. And hopefully they'll be expressing it at a high enough level such that if you were to eat it, that would trigger an immune response to that pathogen. Once this plant was made, 
It could then be easily grown, it could be replicated to provide a constant source of that recombinant protein.